my first guest that I'm going to talk to is a qualified registered dietitian and has a PhD from Imperial College London. She has been a lecturer and researcher at King's College London looking at the role of diet, particularly as it relates to pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, and is also the incoming head of nutrition at the Dasman Diabetes Institute in Q8. Her registered dietitian rotations included some pretty prestigious places, including uh, Baylor College of Medicine uh, in the States. She's been an expert advisor to the NICE guidelines and was a Diabetes UK research fellow. If you want to follow her on any social media and tag any great quotes you may hear from Nicola's mouth, you can follow her handle is doctor underscore underscore guess, so dr two underscores guess, you can follow her on Instagram or uh, Twitter. And so without further ado, please give a big round of applause for Dr. Nicola Guess. Uh, uh, Nicola, take a seat. Thank you. Let's talk some uh, science, let's say. Um, so before we get started, as I just mentioned, you have this new position uh, that's coming in that's kind of uh, evolved from a few things. Maybe can you give us a bit of an insight into what that role is, how that came about, and why you're so excited about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so I work at King's College in London, so my passion is understanding the effect of diet on the development of type 2 diabetes and the management. And one of the things about doing that is it's really, really expensive. So to do my job, what I really need is things like MRI scans on the pancreas and the liver. In the UK, they're about 500 pounds before the diet and 500 pounds afterwards. Um, I also like to, or need to do things like hyperglycemic clamps, uh, which are about 200 pounds a person. Getting money in the UK is really, really hard. We do manage to do that, but we are limited in what we can do. The great thing about Kuwait um, is that they have amazing facilities. So we're going to be able to do some really, really cool studies really quickly. Um, and also, you may not know, of type 1 diabetes outside of Finland, and it also has one of the highest prevalences of type 2 in the world. So in the UK, we have about maybe 8% of people have type 2 diabetes. In Kuwait, it's about 30%. So it's a really exciting place to be to do this research. Amazing. And we'll, we'll definitely dig into more of, of that work. Um, as I was talking to you earlier, what is, at what point did you see that academia and particularly research in this specific field was the thing for you? What got you excited about that in particular? Sure. So I thought uh, I wanted to be a dietitian kind of my whole life. That's what I wanted to be. Um, and I did my qualifications in the States and I came back and I worked in the NHS. And I worked for three years in a hospital in East London uh, with lots of patients with type 2 diabetes. And basically the only advice really Sorry. I could give them... Okay. Do you need me to that's repeat better. anything I've said? That's better. Can okay, people good, hear okay? Good, good. That's okay. Okay, cool. Oh, and I've got, I've got my... And coffee, coffee as well. This Excellent. day has turned Thank out you. great. I've got everything I need. Um, okay, now we can start. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, I'm louder now. Um, so I worked in the NHS for three years, and um, what was evident was the only advice really I could give was limit carbohydrate. Now, that made sense. The community I was working with was largely South Asian, and people would have type 2, have an entire plate of rice with a leucosate to wash it down with. So that's kind of a no-brainer. But other than that, there wasn't really much I can do. And actually, we don't know that much about the effect of diet on type 2 diabetes. And so I thought, well, the best use of my time, I think, is to try to understand far much, or much more about this and then translate that research to clinics. So before we get into any of this stuff around type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes and so on, it's probably a good idea to get into some clear definitions. Yes. So we, we're all in the same wavelength to know what we're talking about. So at, with respect to type 2 diabetes specifically, what is the most accurate or, or comprehensive way we should frame that in our mind to, to explain what that is? Um, they're all quite long-winded. So uh, diabetes is a condition of hyperglycemia. Type 2 diabetes we define um, with a fasting glucose of up 7 seven millimoles per liter, or a two-hour glucose of above 11.1. .1. That's the diagnostic criteria. So one of the ways we diagnose that, if anyone's uh, had any kids and you've had a glucose tolerance test when you were pregnant, you'll know this. We give people a really disgusting sugary drink. Two hours after that sugary drink, we measure their blood glucose. So if your fasting is above seven and your two-hour glucose is above 11.5, sorry, 11.1, .1, that's type 2 diabetes. So it's basically hyperglycemia, that's it. And we diagnose it based on clinical risk factors. 
There is no easy way at all in a GP practice to say that's type one, that's type two. Historically, we've done it by age, by weight, um, but actually it's a little bit, we're learning it's, it's cloudier than we thought. So with that difficulty to diagnose, uh, does that present like a problem for people who may be on the path towards type two diabetes in, in how, how much I suppose, underlying damage, for lack of a better word, can be done before we reach a diagnosis? Oh, that's, so that's a great question, yeah. So, because it's, it's a continuum, your blood glucose basically 10 years prior to diagnosis starts rising and rising and rising. Um, and we diagnose it, like we say, on the, these thresholds, um, but there is real variability within those thresholds. So basically, it, it's, a lot of it is people would get some symptoms, so they'd get thirsty, they'd be urinating a lot, need to drink more water, still be thirsty, still be urinating, they might find themselves losing weight. People typically go to the doctor, and then if you do, and you, you have these measures, then they diagnose you. But you make an excellent point. So. Mm. Um, half of people when they're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes already have some macrovascular damage. Mm. So they already have basically cardiovascular disease. They have the stuff we get concerned about. Um, and so we think that happens in the pre-diabetic stage. So people can have pre-diabetes, there are no symptoms, completely unaware of it, and all of the dam or lots of the damage is being done already. Right, so we have this kind of progressive disease that's happening. We have this state of pre-diabetes before. Yeah. We have a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. So under the surface, what's going on with this pre-diabetic stage as someone is progressing along to that point? Um, so that primarily when someone is developing type 2, there are two primary pathophysiological factors. So the first is insulin resistance that I'm sure lots of people have heard of. And essentially this is when the tissues, primarily muscle and liver, don't respond properly to insulin. The second thing that happens is that you get defective insulin secretion. So mostly we think this is about the beta cells. So the beta cells in the pancreas are the cells that produce insulin. What we do know from early studies and people who, are, who have relatives with type 2 but are, say, kids, you know, their blood glucose isn't, isn't high, but they have the genetic uh, risk factors for it, they already have some signs of beta cell dysfunction. So a lot of these things are present really, really early on in the, in the disease. Mm. So it's defective insulin secretion and insulin resistance. Just to make a couple of points really clear, there's lots of people talking around on the internet that type 2 is insulin resistance. That's the only thing that matters. That's not true. About 60% of the population have insulin resistance. And yes, we need to be concerned about it. But you don't get type 2 unless you also have dysfunctional beta cells. Um, so that's a really important distinction. The, the seminal defect in the development of type 2 is that the beta cells functionally don't work properly. Right. I think that was one thing that I was going to ask about of when we have this insulin resistance and this decline in beta cell function, is that relationship between that they are intrinsically tied together? Or are they two independent things that once they both manifest, we have this issue? So this is an incredibly complex question. Um, and it's, it's more complex because these things are difficult to measure. Um, what we think happens is that there's no set way of getting type 2. So let me give you an example. I might have a patient, and I would guess if they were Caucasian, um, 50 years old, a BMI of 35, and they develop, with, they develop type 2, that a lot of that is, is insulin resistance is, is a major part of that. And actually, yes, they'll have beta cell failure or functional failure, but most of it's insulin resistance. And they're quite easy to manage because weight loss improves insulin resistance. Let me give you another example. If I have a patient who's 28 years old, Southern Asian, probably very slim, maybe active, and they have type 2, then insulin resistance is a tiny part of the equation. There's probably a larger contribution coming from the beta cells. So the heterogeneity, the, very, the varying character of type 2 diabetes, we're beginning to realize. Right. When we talk about this decline in uh, beta cell function, how can we frame that like, more precisely of what's going on? So, or in other words, why is that an issue, what is causing some of the pathophysiology that leads from that? Um, this, is the, this is the toughest question in research because it's really, really hard to measure. Um, there are lots of hypotheses. So some of it is genetic. Um, like I said, if you can find a five-year-old who's perfectly healthy, isn't overweight, and has a defective uh, beta cell function, that suggests there's some kind of early link, link to or, or hereditary cause of it. Um, in terms of though, what happens when it develops, this is really a vicious cycle. So there are a couple of hypotheses or um, theories around it. One is called uh, 
glucotoxicity and the other's lipotoxicity. So glucotoxicity, so gluco, glucose, toxic, toxicity speaks for itself. It's the idea that glucose itself is toxic. So above a certain concentration, glucose becomes toxic to the beta cells. So then you imagine a situation where you're developing prediabetes, your blood glucose is going slightly up, and it's elevated kind of all the time, that that itself starts adding to the destruction of the beta cells. Mm. What also happens when you develop type 2 diabetes is you get elevated lipid circulating around the blood. And again, this hypothesis is that, okay, so maybe when you start developing elevated triglycerides or fatty acids, they then too start damaging the beta cell. So it becomes this vicious cycle. Mm. And this is when it's really hard to identify the primary factor going wrong because there's lots of different factors and they all... Um, interact with each other. Right. So once this dysfunction is present, and at risk of this being maybe an oversimple question, why is that a problem? What is it that having, or that the beta cells are doing, that once we see this decline of function, what is that leading to? Okay, sure. So, so the pancreas produces insulin all the time. It produces insulin in the fasting state, though not that much. What's really evident when someone starts developing type 2 is the postprandial glucose rise. So the pancreas, or the beta cells of the pancreas, actually have glucose sensors on them. It's really sophisticated that they can sense the tiniest rise in your blood glucose. So let's imagine you have um, half a slice of toast. You maybe have a small sip of orange juice, whatever it might be. When your blood glucose moves as much as 0.3 moles per litre, a tiny amount. The sensors in the pancreas can, can recognise that and it starts to produce insulin. And that's really important because it enables the body to anticipate a rise in glucose and that you produce enough insulin to to uh, control your blood glucose. Mm. So let me just go back a few steps. So what insulin actually does is insulin uh, moves, simply put, glucose from the bloodstream into the tissues. So it will take glucose and put it into the muscle where it can be oxidized and used for energy. It can take glucose and it gets stored in the adipose tissue as triglyceride and it can um, help uh, get glucose and, and fat into the liver and other tissues. So if that's not happening, if insulin isn't working properly, glucose doesn't go to the muscle, it doesn't go into the adipose tissue, it stays in the blood and that's hyperglycemia. So when you don't have an appropriate rise of glucose after you eat, that causes really marked, we call them glucose excursions. Um, and this is how bad it can get. So in a healthy person, I would be very surprised if your blood glucose at any time went above 9.5 millimoles per litre after you eat. We see people with 30 with wow. type 2 diabetes, yeah. Because of the combined effects of insulin resistance, but primarily that beta cell defect. Perfect. I definitely want to get back to blood glucose excursions and spikes after meals a bit later on. Um, before we get there, we've already kind of given a diagnosis of or a explanation of the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, what cutoff points they have. For pre-diabetes, what are we talking about there in order to determine if someone is pre-diabetic? Okay, so I said that type 2 diabetes is a fasting of 7. Pre-diabetes starts at 6.1. Um, I, then I said the two-hour glucose in type 2 starts at 11.1, in prediabetes it's 7.8. So if your fasting glucose is 6.1 to 6.9, that's prediabetes, or if your two-hour glucose is 7.8 to 11, that's prediabetes. But I should add, this is total guesswork, um, because why do we care about prediabetes? Like, why have we got these diagnostic criteria? Mm. It's because we want to identify people at risk of type 2. And the cutoffs that we have are incredibly poor to predict type 2 diabetes. Um, if you take people within those, those boundaries that I talked about, about half of people in a year will develop type 2. Half of people will stay pre-diabetic. Sorry, a third of people will develop type 2. A third of people will stay pre-diabetic. And a third of people actually go from pre-diabetes back to normal. So pre-diabetes is a very controversial, uh, it's not even a diagnosis, but we right. have those, those criteria to kind of guess, really. Right. So, so that two-hour response is based on like an oral glucose tolerance test? Absolutely, right? yes. Okay. So if it's, uh, if I'm picking you up right, we have for pre-diabetes, it can be when fasting blood glucose is between 6.1 and 6.9, or it could be a case where that two-hour postprandial response uh, in a glucose tolerance test is elevated. Does that suggest then if it's one or the other, we could have a case where someone maybe has a normal fasting blood glucose, but this uh, really weird response after they have a, a challenge with glucose? 
Yes, so that's, that absolutely happens. And again, it comes back to the heterogeneity of type 2. So pre-diabetes is really an umbrella term, and it's more a term for public health, because to get people to realise they're at risk, pre-diabetes kind of sums it up quite nicely. But actually, it's an umbrella term for different mm. conditions. So one of those is impaired fasting glucose. Like, the name speaks for itself. Your fasting glucose is elevated. But if you eat something, your postprandial, so your after-meal glucose, actually is normal. On the other hand, you can have people who have normal fasting blood glucose. So if they went to the doctor, had their fasting blood glucose measured, there would be no concern whatsoever because it would be completely normal. But then you give them something to eat and they get this massive excursion. Um, and do you want me to go into the, hetero the, the pathophysiology of that yes, and why please. that's different? Yeah. So you might be thinking, well, that's like two separate conditions. And you're absolutely right. Yes, it probably is. Um, so what we think happens, if you have impaired fasting glucose, it's because your liver but not your muscles are insulin resistant. And that kind of makes sense because the liver's role is primarily to keep you alive when you're fasting. So it can produce glucose and it can produce fatty acids that keep you alive. So it makes sense that if insulin's not working properly on the liver, that's when glucose leaks out of the liver and boom, your fasting glucose is elevated. On the other hand, after you eat, in the normal state, your muscles take up 80% of the glucose. So postprandially, your muscles really suck out tons of the glucose from your meal. So if you've got muscle insulin resistance, again, it makes sense that after you eat, postprandially, your glucose is elevated only after you eat. Mm. So actually, they are probably two separate conditions. And what we're realizing probably, and what my work tries to do, is figure out how we can target nutrition to the underlying pathophysiology. So insulin resistance in the liver or insulin resistance in the muscle because they're two very different things. So if we talk about these spikes in blood glucose or where it gets elevated to a certain point, I think that's probably a good place to clarify a few things because uh, the way it's often framed, it's that anytime someone spikes their blood glucose, it's a bad thing per se. Um, and here we've already talked about uh, glucotoxicity. We've talked about this... Uh, poor glycemic response after meals where blood glucose stays elevated. But how should we think about spikes in blood glucose? Uh, so on one hand, are they necessarily a problem? Or what is it that makes an elevated blood glucose problematic? Yeah. That's a really, really great point. So we know that type 2 diabetes, that the, the hyperglycemia that you see in type 2 diabetes, we know that's harmful. It causes damage to the uh, blood vessels, causes damage to the nerves, etc. In pre-diabetes, again, that evidence is pretty convincing in terms of observational studies. It definitely causes damage and increases risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, then it becomes, in my opinion, people are kind of developing a little bit of paranoia about this. Um, so like I said, let's put this into context. Pre-diabetes is if your fasting is above 6.1 um, and postprandially, two-hour glucose is above 7.8. We don't know much about what happens in between. So, the, so let's say I gave you a glucose drink and 30 minutes after you took the glucose drink, your blood glucose was 11.2. If it comes back down again, I don't think that's a concern. We have no evidence that that might be a concern. Mm. Um, so all, th there isn't convincing data that hyperglycemia at some points during a, after you eat is harmful whatsoever. And there's a growing trend of using CGMs. So CGMs is continuous glucose monitoring. It's designed for people with diabetes. It measures blood glucose every five minutes for 24 hours, and it's great for them to keep their condition under control. What you're seeing is that you have perfectly healthy people without pre-diabetes, at no risk of pre-diabetes, using this stuff. And panicking because their glucose, you know, 20 minutes after they eat goes to 6.8 or something. Uh, and that's really concerning because we have no idea it probably doesn't cause any harm whatsoever. Um, because if you took an athlete, like a very, very healthy person, and you gave them three slices of bread, their glucose would, as you call it, like spike, mm. but it would come straight back down again mm. because they're insulin sensitive and they can use it properly. So I think you make a really good point. We need to really differentiate between the hyperglycemia of diabetes and normal physiology. Right, yeah, that distinction, I guess, between an elevation in blood glucose versus chronically high blood glucose Absolutely, all the time. Yes, yes. So presumably, uh, does the same thing hold true if we're talking about insulin? Because a lot of the time, the same kind of argument gets put forth that if you have this big spike in blood glucose, your insulin goes up, and then the, these are problematic. So would it be, and I'm just wondering, 
does a rapid response in terms of, or a rapid rise in glucose and insulin, is that any more problematic versus it more continuous, but not as a big a spike over the day? So let's say the area under the curve for insulin over 24 hours was the same, but one had these massive increases and then drops again versus one that's kind of just more continuous. Is there anything to suggest that those things play a role? So that's a really good question. Does everyone know what area under the curve is? Sorry, I, I should explain things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was impressed. Like, can I, you raise your hand if you know what area under the curve means? Okay, okay, good. I mean, so basically what we're talking about is like, oh, isn't it, over, like exposure to insulin. So overall 24-hour right. exposure to insulin. So this is this whole hyperinsulinemia thing. So if you hear someone use hyperinsulinemia without clarifying it, they probably don't know what they're talking about. So let's just take it back to normal physiology. So in normal physiology, in a perfectly slim person, after you eat, like I said, the, the pancreas is really sensitive to changes in glucose, and you should and you do get this pronounced insulin spike. I don't like the word insulin spike, but I'm going to use it. So in normal physiology, you get this pronounced insulin spike, goes up really high, really quick, and then it normally comes back down again. And that's because insulin is very powerful at shutting down glucose output from the liver. It's very powerful at shutting down um, lipolysis. So lipolysis is the fat coming out of the adipose tissue. And it also really promotes the uptake of glucose into the tissues. So if you have this insulin spike, what that will do is switch your metabolism from a fasting metabolism to a fed metabolism. That's exactly what should happen. Because let's think about this, if you're fasting, you obviously need glucose coming out from your liver, but you have your breakfast and you have some cereal, some toast, the glucose is coming from the meal. So you want to shut down the release of glucose from the liver immediately. And that's what the insulin spike does, and that's normal. The concern that happens is when, and this is probably two things, people get insulin resistance, so you have that normal spike, <clears throat> but because the tissues are resistant to the actions of the insulin, your pancreas has kind of got to produce more and more. So then it goes from, this is normal, spike straight back down again. What happens with some insulin resistance is it goes up and then it kind of struggles to come down because you've got to produce more insulin to get glucose under control. The second thing is, is that we know from early tests that people who are developing type 2 lose that spike. So even if you inject them intravenously with glucose, they are not able to produce that insulin spike. So then what happens is the pancreas kind of, you know when you start your car, it doesn't work properly a few times and then it does. That's what happens with the pancreas. So you don't get that initial insulin spike, but eventually the pancreas gets it together, manages to produce a bit more insulin. And that's when you get this profile that looks like this like pathetic rise here, but then it continues for a long time after mm. you eat. So your exposure to insulin is probably longer lasting um, and that possibly could be damaging yeah and we'll i presume definitely get onto that later on um, particularly if we talk about low carbohydrate diets and some of the ideas around that but to shift to some of the dietary interventions we can look at to not only prevent manage and maybe even put diabetes into remission uh, i wanted to start with that piece on diabetes remission or reversal and there may be need to maybe distinguish between some of those terms as well, or at least uh, define what we're talking about here. Because um, at least to me, sometimes there can be confusion if we're talking about a potential strategy can put diabetes into remission, or you see places online talking about this strategy will reverse diabetes. And so I'm just wondering, how, what is the accurate way to think of diabetes remission versus this idea that something is gonna mean that person no longer has diabetes? And are yeah. they slightly different things? Yeah, um, so in general, remission is a much better term. Um, and it basically means is that you currently don't have the condition of diabetes anymore. There has been a proposed definition, and that is that your glucose is no longer diabetic at a diabetic level, and you have to have been off your diabetes medications for two months. So that's been a proposed definition. I think it's a fair one. Because if we think about what patients with type 2 diabetes want, like most people hate taking their medications. If any of you are, or you know people who have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, it can be awful. Uh, Pricking your finger to measure your capillary blood glucose is actually painful, it's not very nice. Injecting insulin every single day of your life is not pleasant. So the desire for people to come off their medications is the, the primary motivating factor. So people want remission, because remission means you're no longer on your medications, but glucose is normal. Mm. I don't like the word reversal, mm. and I tend to see it used when people are selling something. Um, and to me, reversal means you can go back to your normal life and not 
be concerned that type 2 diabetes will develop again, and it probably will. Right. And I think that's the, the key thing, and that's something that hit me when people use this term reversal, because even if you get someone to a place where they're no longer exhibiting symptoms, or like you said, they're no longer medications, does that mean they can go back to eating kind of whatever and have a, a response that someone who doesn't have type 2 diabetes has? And I think they're probably completely different things. Yeah, so I think this depends on how you achieve remission, because remission is super new. So if any of you are aware of the DIRECT study, this was a study that came out in the Lancet last year, where they used very low energy diets, and they managed to get at least 50% of people off their medication. The more weight, lo weight people lost, the greater their chances of remission were. Now that remission occurs because you get the first the insulin spike back. So remember I was saying, in healthy people you get this insulin spike like this, when you get type two it's pathetic, like this, what the very low energy diet protocol does, the reason why it gets remission, the predicting factor of why it gets remission is because you get the insulin spike back. Now that came out last year, so we have no idea of the long-term follow-up or what it looks like. Those data should be out about now. So the one-year data came out December of 2018, so this two-year data should come out now. What is amazing about that study is that they put people on a very low energy diet, so it was about 900 calories on average a day. People lost 15 kilograms of weight, that's an extraordinary amount of weight, at about three to four months, and that's when their glucose went, became normal. They followed people up for a year, so they maintained their weight loss. But what's really important is that they weren't still on that diet. So they were on the very low energy diet, but they went back to a weight maintaining diet. So they were in normal energy balance. So what is striking and suggests there is a legacy effect of the very low energy diet is that they're still in remission at one year. Now, I expect at two years, those people are going to have gained some, some weight. And that's really going to tell us how durable remission is. Like, how much do you then need to control your weight and control your lifestyle to stay in remission? We don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. And if I can just come to low-carbohydrate diets, because I have a particular interest in these. Low-carb, and there's, there's no studies on this, which is just embarrassing, um, because there's so much talk and noise. Low-carb probably is able to get remission more easily, because if you don't have exogenous, so outside carbohydrate coming into the bloodstream, you, blood glucose doesn't go up. It's nothing to do with fixing the pancreas. It's nothing to do with insulin sensitivity. If you go low carb enough, exogenous glucose doesn't enter the bloodstream, boom, your postprandial glucose is controlled. So I think that low carb would be better at getting remission than other methods, but there's no study on that yet, um, a well-controlled study, but that works differently. And mm. one thing with low carb and low carb, you hear the cure, oh, we've cured it. The moment you reintroduce carbs, your blood glucose goes straight back up again. So right. there's a real distinction between how you achieve remission. Yeah, so, so let's talk about some of those specific strategies. Uh, first, even before we get into very low energy diets, um, you talked about that 15 kilogram weight loss. And that does seem to be quite a trend across the data that it's weight loss can drive these dramatic changes. Uh, is it fair to say that that would be the, the primary thing or primary target of a dietary intervention for diabetes? At the moment, 100%, yes. That's really strong data. As you say, if anyone's read that paper, there's this beautiful graph that shows if you get 15 kilograms or more of weight loss, 86% of people get remission. If you go down to 10, it's about 57. And it's, it's clearly a dose-response relationship. Mm. The more weight you lose, the higher your chance of remission. So yes, my advice to any person with type 2 wanting remission is weight loss. Um, but I think other methods could add to that. Right. Uh, one interesting thing I heard, and uh, be interested hear if, if this plays out or not. Uh, when we see this pronounced effect of weight loss um, in improving symptoms and putting remission in place, uh, that even if someone were to gain that weight back, it's potential that they could still have a net benefit compared to if they'd never lost the weight. Is there anything to that hypothesis and, and what do we have to shed light on that? So we know there is in prevention of type 2, so in, there are lots of prevention of type 2 studies where people lose weight, as they always do in studies, they regain it, and your risk of developing type 2 if you lose weight and regain it is lower than had you never lost weight at all. In terms of remission of type 2, we don't know that yet because it's new, mm. um, but what the investigators of that study are doing is doing some modelling work, um, looking at the risk factors of patients in remission and seeing whether that um, results in a reduction in risk over time. Okay, so when it comes to weight loss, 
Um, and again, this could lead us down a, a rabbit hole, so uh, feel free to <laughs> skip this if we wish. But what is it mechanistically that leads to weight loss being such a powerful thing for uh, type 2 diabetes and, and pre-diabetes? What is going on that makes it that powerful? So it's going to be a mixture of things. Um, definitely um, ectopic fat. So ectopic fat means fat deposited where it shouldn't be. So liver fat is a big player here, probably pancreatic fat. Weight loss reduces that really quickly. In fact, if you lose weight, you lose fat from your liver first. The second thing is insulin sensitivity, partly linked to liver fat. If you lose weight, if you lose a kilogram or two kilograms or three, you improve insulin sensitivity. There's also a role for inflammation. So people talk about inflammatory factors, which we know interfere with insulin signaling. We know that weight loss improves inflammation. So it's definitely multifactorial. Mm. So let, let's take a look at some of the uh, low carbohydrate interventions, because as you say, a, a big interest area of yours, and you've paid a lot of attention to that. Uh, from a, an overview level first, what are, why is it so interesting, compelling to you to look at this dietary intervention? And to this point, what do you think is fair to conclude about their, their role? Um, so I think it goes back to the weight loss conversation. So pretty much with type 2 diabetes now, the advice is weight loss. Whatever diet you have, weight loss is going to help you. Mm. Where I think the potential advantage of low carb is, is that you don't need to lose weight to have probably amazing reductions in your blood glucose. Uh, there is a stud study by um, Gannon, uh, which I encourage everyone to look at. They've done a series of studies where they were beautifully well controlled, so no one lost or gained any weight. Um, they measured their blood glucose and their insulin 24 hours, and what they found is that blood glucose went from something like 20 postprandially down to 10, normalized with no weight loss. And that was about a 20% carb intervention or 30% calories from carb, but they also had high protein. So this is where it gets difficult. People are really anti-guidelines and they think the diabetes guidelines are terrible because of corruption or special interests. They're not actually, the, the, the data are quite equivocal. So protein's important because protein helps the pancreas produce insulin. So I think that study is awesome because no one lost weight and your blood glucose normalized pretty much. That's remission. Um, but because they gave low carb and a lot of protein, you can't tell it's the carb. So a study we're looking at is going to try to find that out. Mm. There is another study done where there was no weight loss. This was done by Manny Noakes. Don't confuse Noakes with Tim Noakes. Manny Noakes in Australia. Um, and this was comparing keto. So it's a super low carb diet. Um, and they have these beautiful graphs because they did a meal tolerance test. That's where you give someone a test that is low carb. And then they gave oral glucose tolerance tests before and after this diet. And what the meal tolerance test showed is that the moment you give someone a low carb meal, the effect on their glucose is immediate. There's no need to wait for it to take effect. If you go low carb, your blood glucose postprandially just goes boom, right down. They followed them up for 12 weeks, gave them the meal tolerance test again, the blood glucose was still low. But they also did the oral glucose tolerance test. And the moment after that low carb diet, you reintroduce carbohydrate, the carbohydrate goes straight, so the glucose goes straight back up again. So what those data show, low carbohydrate diets probably can lower postprandial glucose amazingly while you follow the diet. The moment you reintroduce carbohydrate, your blood glucose goes straight back up again. Mm. Um, but that was not done in people with type 2. So they're two really compelling data, other shorter, shorter term studies. But unfortunately, no one will base guidelines on those data because they're, they're not in type 2 or they also have confounding factors. Right. I, I think the, uh, what you, you mentioned, you're going to look into this distinction between low carbohydrate with high protein versus low carbohydrate with perhaps lower protein, higher in fat is an interesting one. Uh, where would your hypothesis be on what's going to, or would, would we see distinct differences? And if so, what mechanistically could be the reason okay. why? Okay, so, so um, let me just explain the study that we have planned. So basically it's a five week long study. It's patients with diet control type two. We're using CGM, so that's the, um, apparatus I mentioned that measures blood glucose every five minutes continually. What we do is we keep the carb low all the time. So the carb's going to be 20% of calories. We start with seven days on a high protein diet, so sorry, a low protein diet, 15% 15 15 of calories. So let me start again. So keep them low carb all the time. 
For the first week, we have 15% of calories from protein. We then take it up for two weeks at 30% of calories from protein. We take it down again for two weeks to 15%. So basically what I want to see and what I think we'll see is low carb does lower your glucose compared to the normal diet, but adding in protein has an extra effect on blood glucose. Mm. In terms of the mechanism, it's probably because some amino acids help the pancreas produce insulin. There is some evidence, we're planning another study to look at this, that in type 2 diabetes, your, pan your beta cells can't detect glucose. So rem re remember I said you have this sensor that can monitor changes in glucose levels. In type 2, we know that doesn't work properly. But there is some data that suggests that your body, when you have type 2, can recognize amino acids. So if that's the case, and then maybe if you've got type 2 and you follow a high protein diet, your body can recognize the amino acids and produce enough insulin. So I think it's all to do with the insulin secretion with protein. Right. Uh, we mentioned a bit earlier when we have this uh, insulin secretion and it's at a super high level chronically, that can be damaging in certain ways. Does that lend value to the idea then that even if we don't see weight loss, if someone's trying to manage that condition and they're very insulin resistant, maybe they're pre-diabetic or, or diabetic, and they're on a low carbohydrate diet, that has a net health benefit from the perspective of they're not going to be asked to secrete as much insulin. If I had to bet, I would say yes, probably. Um, but physiology is extremely complex, and I don't think we know that yet. Okay. Um, like I say, low carb, there's so much noise around it. Um, it's of real value, I think, in type 2, but the quality of data out there is really poor, um, and there haven't been very good studies uh, being done. Mm -hmm. One study that we're planning, actually, at the Desmond Diabetes Institute is looking at a low carb diet on beta cell function. Um, because I actually think maybe it could help because if go back to what I said about glucotoxicity, glucotox if the glucose levels themselves in diabetes are harming the beta cells um, and low carb can reduce blood glucose, maybe low carb can actually help the beta cells function better. So that's something we're going mm. to be testing. Right. Uh, is there a certain point we can reach with beta cell dysfunction where... They, we, we just can't go back, that it becomes irreversible. And at, w at what point can we maybe restore function completely, or, or do we know? Um, so to give some history to this, um, type 2 diabetes is a progressive condition. Um, and the reason we know that, um, and we've always thought that, is because within 10 years of diagnosis, half of people have to go on insulin. And the reason you have to go on insulin is because the pancreas isn't producing insulin anymore. Um, we also know if you take a cadaver, so if you take people who've passed away, with type 2 diabetes and compare the weight of the pancreas and the weight of the beta cells to people without diabetes, it, w it weighs less. So in other words, it looks like the beta cells have died. We call this apoptosis. So all of the data together suggests that it's a progressive disease and the beta cells die over time. That's what we've always thought. Then when bariatric surgery came along, so that's the gastric bypass, what was observed was that people with type 2 diabetes got cured, essentially. They got remission of their type 2 diabetes within 24 to 48 hours of having the surgery. Um, and that was amazing because, like I said, everyone had always thought it was progressive. And so it got people to thinking, well, hold on a second, maybe it's not, because you can have people who've had diabetes for 15 years, and they come off all of their medication, and their blood glucose is totally controlled. And so it got people thinking, why might it be? And so before you have bariatric surgery, you have to go on a liver-reducing diet. So it's a two-week, very low energy or very low carb diet to reduce the size of the liver to make the operation easier. You then have to fast prior to having the surgery, after you have the surgery, because it's major surgery where they reattach your intestines. Uh, you can't eat much. Uh, you go on a clear liquid diet after the surgery, which is like 100 calories a day, if that. Then you go on a, a, a other liquid diet, and that's about three, 400 calories. So essentially, you are on a starvation diet when you have bariatric surgery for about seven to eight weeks. And so it got people thinking, maybe it's that that's causing remission of type 2 diabetes. And that's what led to the direct study. Now, what was observed with the bariatric surgery is not everyone got remission. Even if you lost 50, 60 kilograms, not everyone did. And so, like you say, one of the predictors was how long a person had had type 2 diabetes. The longer you have type 2, the less your chance of getting remission with bariatric surgery. And we know the same is true, or we think the same is true, for a very low energy diet. Mm. So, the direct study only included people who'd had type 2 diabetes for six years. Because probably after six years, maybe like you say, 
we, we don't know whether the beta cells have died, but it certainly looks like maybe at the moment there is a point of no return, but we don't know when that is yet. Mm. Um, uh, Sorry, I def- did I just go on a complete tangent? I felt yeah. like you asked me a really short <laughs> question and I just gave you a no, history. That's perfect. Uh, I, I do want to come back to the direct trial, but before that, because we've been talking about low-carbohydrate diets. I think if people have maybe had discussions online or got into debates around this, one that tends to be brought up is the Verda Health trial. And again, there's, um, uh, while super interesting things to come from that, there's also some clear limitations, which I'm sure we'll get to. Um, And just in in case people are unfamiliar, Verda Health is essentially this group based in in the States, I believe, who have this program, which is a ketogenic diet in combination with lots of intensive support uh, regularly for people, um, and they've basically been collecting data on that. Um, that has been one I've, u- I've seen people point to uh, as something that's kind of groundbreaking in many ways. Um, but like I said, there's some limitations we may address. Uh, what were your initial reaction to some of the, the results and data that come from that? And maybe you can fill people in on what that might be. Um, and then your kind of response to that right now or or what you thought? Um, So Verta basically is an online program like where they do a ketogenic diet. Uh, It's really close one-to-one coaching um, and they're basically trying to get remission. Like that was the aim. They're trying to get people off their medications. What was really interesting about Verta, so like I mentioned Direct, Direct was trying to get remission but they did so by rebooting the beta cells and they didn't include people who'd had type 2 diabetes for a long time. What was great about Verta, it was a kind of come one, come all. If you have type 2 for however long, if if you're on insulin, if you're on 100 units of insulin a day, you can go on this program. The con- compelling data for me from that was that people came off their insulin. So like I said, if any of you know any, if you have relatives or friends with type 2 diabetes who take insulin, it is not a nice thing to do. Mm. And so about half of people on that program came off their insulin. So they had normal glucose and they could come off their insulin. Um, and the other half of people on insulin could halve their dose. So yes, they still require insulin, but they need half as much. And that's really never been shown before. Um, if we think about our National Health Service, any health service, frankly, around the world, are all going to be bankrupt by type 2 diabetes. Mm. Um, if you look at any of your local GP practices or local CCGs, they probably spend in the millions every month on diabetes medications and support. So to be able to have this dietary dietary program that gets people off their diabetes medications is huge. Um, so that's what I found really exciting, the possibility that, yes, you can come off your insulin. Right, yeah, for, for sure. And I think when you see the, the magnitude of some of the changes in those results, that was the thing that kind of strikes you oh, first. Yeah. Um, but obviously balancing with it wasn't a randomized control trial, et cetera, et cetera, but still pretty interesting to see. Yeah, so let me just kind of add to that just to make that clear. So in the Verta trial, there wasn't a control group that achieved the same weight, and this has what, been what's hindered uh, low-carb being more promoted in guidelines because they, mm. they lost 15 kilograms in Verta. So they lost 15 kilograms in direct, most of them got remission. They lost 15 kilograms in Verta, people got remission. And I'm kind of guessing, I, this is conjecture, I think Verta did better with people on insulin because low carb lowers your postprandial glucose Um, but we can't say it's better because there was no control group that lost the same weight um, which weren't low carb right yeah Uh, with some of the other dietary interventions that tend to get discussed around uh, this area things like intermittent fasting uh, time restricted feeding has been kind of one too Um, what is kind of current state of the literature do you believe on some of these areas and obviously it's hard to navigate at this point, but uh, yeah. what are your initial impressions of other dietary strategies? I don't think we have enough evidence to say at all at the moment. Um, so with the trouble with intermittent fasting, it can mean lots of things. It can mean fasting on two consecutive days, one day a week, two days a week separate. It could mean that you fast completely on one day or take 400 calories. So it's totally, totally varied. That's really hard to interpret. Um, A lot of the observational work has been done like in Ramadan when people are fasting all day and then they're eating at night, which isn't necessarily because when I have friends who do Ramadan, they tend to eat very high sugar, high fat sweets when they break their fast. That's not what you'd necessarily recommend people do. So that data doesn't look good. And I think it's because people are 
not following fasting in the healthiest way. For me, the most compelling stuff and the most exciting stuff is coming from time-restricted feeding, but there's been one, st one good study to my knowledge in humans. So this was published in Cell Metabolism earlier this year. It was eight people, this is tiny, mm. eight obese males with pre-diabetes, and it was beautifully controlled. So one group, if I remember correctly, they could only eat between 8 and 2 p.m., so 8 in the morning and 2 p.m. The other group could eat whenever they wanted, but the weight loss was beautifully maintained through the study. And what they found was the insulin sensitivity had improved and fat oxidation was higher in the time-restricted feeding group, um, which is pretty compelling, but hey, it's eight people uh, mm. and it's one study in humans. But I, there's lots of work going on at the moment in that. Um, but I think the key is, like anyone in the room, raise your hands if you think you can have a great social life eating only between eight in the morning and 2 p.m. Like what just happened to your weekend? <laughs> Um, so, so this kind of stuff has to be translatable. So people are doing stuff like, okay, what if you fast all weekend, sorry, fast all day and then just eat at night? How does that work? Um, because even if something's physiologically effective, it's got to be something that translates to something people can do. Right. So to, to circle back to what we, we've said about weight loss being that primary driver or that, that primary target for us, is there a certain magnitude of weight loss that comes into this. Is any weight loss going to improve things? Is there a certain threshold? Or uh, how should we think about how much is necessary mm. to see some of these benefits? Okay, so that's a really great question. And we don't, I can't answer this definitively because we have one remission trial. Um, certainly the more the better. Um, with type 2 diabetes, it looks like 12 kilograms or more is necessary. And it's kind of weird because that doesn't make sense that you would think that certain people could lose five kilograms and get remission, but it just seems that's not gonna happen. And no one understands why this is. Um, certainly what's clear, I think, from the lit literature is if you lose 5% of weight, that doesn't do anything to your beta cells. So remember I said with direct, that with the story there was all about rebooting the beta cells. That's why you get remission. And it looks like you need a lot of weight loss to, get, to achieve that. But why that is the mechanism, no one knows. Mm. We, looking at the data, it looks like, like I said, if you lose a moderate amount of weight, you don't reboot your beta cells. So certainly for people with type 2 diabetes, I think we need to really reevaluate the kind of weight loss we're recommending to people. Because what we've done as dietitians for like 20 years is, oh, we'll try and eat a bit less, try and exercise a bit more, um, lose a bit of weight, that's really going to help you. And yes, it will. But I think it's pretty clear that's not going to get remission. And what we hear, where, where I work in South London and nationwide, is patients want remission. Um, and I think what we need to be working on is ways that we can achieve that. Um, let me just say one other thing about, about weight loss, is weight loss is one of the things that's probably driving remission. But the other thing is the rate of weight loss. So if you lose 15 kilograms over a year, that's going to be fine, you're going to get remission. But other studies have done a 400 calorie a day diet for seven days and basically found the same effect on physiology. So if you have 400 calories a diet a day, that's tiny, it's, it's mega starvation. But in seven days, you lose about 1.2 kilograms. You don't lose a lot of weight, but that does the same thing to the underlying pathophysiology. It reboots the beta cells. So possibly if you lost six to 7% of body weight, but you did so really quickly in two weeks, that might get the same effect on remission. Mm. So could that indicate there, it's not just necessarily the fat loss that's going on, it's the degree of caloric restriction is having some other effect mechanistically, or I guess we... we like, honestly, I don't know. It mm. might be, and no one's ever measured this, it might be because the rate of weight loss somehow influences fat mm. oxidation. Um, like, your guess is right. as good as mine, right. I think. So we have quite a few people here who are kind of practitioners, whether that's nutritionists, dietitians, uh, a couple of doctors and so on, people working as personal trainers. Um, of course, the, the recommendations will probably vary depending on someone's scope, but when they are dealing with people who are either pre-diabetic or diabetic, where do you feel right now is safe to say this is the kind of center of the bullseye for what we should be doing in practice, how we should aim to to set this out if we can find like a theoretical best way. Um, so, so prevention and, and management are different. So let me mm. tackle those different separately. Prevention, weight loss, however it's achieved. If a person can lose weight with low carb, intermittent fasting, uh, whatever the diet might be, weight loss is going to help prevent type 2 diabetes unequivocally. Exercise, by the way, can also prevent type 2 independent of weight loss. 
But when it comes to management, this is, a, this is where things get a bit challenging, I think. Because again, certainly weight loss is always going to help. But I think there is an ethical obligation. Now that we know that you can achieve remission, physiologically remission can happen, I feel like we, every practitioner has an eth ethical obligation to let their patient know of the interventions and the data that are available. Mm. Uh, one other thing that can get kind of become in, in kind of pragmatically is when we look at supplementation. Um, some people will have heard suggestions around, for example, berberine can help with, with glycemic control. Uh, is there anything that you think is well established that is useful to include in terms of dietary supplements, or are there others that you see promoted a lot that you think are not worth? Uh, I mean, to be honest, most of the, most of the studies done are pretty poor. Um, so I wouldn't say unequivocally there are any that I, actually I wouldn't recommend any. Um, and actually one of my concerns about promoting these uh, products, even when there is an effect, I think cinnamon is one where there's, there's some data which seems to be fairly consistent, but it's about the effect size. And so the effect size is how much does your blood glucose lower if you take some of these products or supplements. And that's my concern because the effect size on glucose with weight loss is huge. The effect size on mortality with those things is huge and that's what our role as practitioners. And I think my concern with some of those other things is that the effect size is pretty tiny. So mm. statistically, yes, it's significant, but clinically, do we really care? Um, so if I have patients who are taking some of those supplements, I might look them, look them up, look at the evidence. If they're not going to be harmful, I, I don't necessarily say stop, stop taking them mm. if they want to, but I never recommend supplements. Right. Um, one that's probably going to be more relevant for those involved in kind of uh, medicine would be the role of metformin, which yeah. I think is what most of those supplements try and mimic we want these benefits but never really get there. Uh, but at this stage, metformin or, or uh, glucophage, which people would have seen the brand name, tends to be pretty compelling and safe in general. Yeah. Would that be a fair way to... Oh, definitely, yeah. Mm. So, so metformin can lower your blood glucose uh, by nine millimoles per mole, so that's A1C, so taking it down to like 48. Mm. Um, the, the effect size is huge. It's an insulin sensitizer. There's good evidence on CVD prevention and other preclinical trials um, on diseases, including cancer. That's preclinical, by the way. Um, very safe. So this, it's been well studied. It's cheap. Um, so that would d definitely be my recommendation. Awesome. Lots of people think we should be using it for prevention, mm. which um, I don't have a problem with. Right. Uh, I've definitely seen that, that for sure. Uh, one final thing before I get into people's questions. So for any of you who do have questions for Nicola, maybe a, a good time is to if you haven't already, put them in now. So that's just, remember, slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and just use the hashtag SNRLive. Uh, before that, the final question was more about either people who are like to monitor blood tests for themselves or get regular checkups or are recommending that to family and friends and so on. Uh, we have the typical things like fasting blood glucose, fasting insulin. Uh, what else do you think is worth people keeping a monitor on, obviously in combination with, with their doctor? Um, so other things we could mention like hemoglobin A1C, the glucose tolerance test. What kind of scope of things do you think is the, the primary thing to in terms of first. developing type 2? Yeah, so if someone, let's say we have someone who's maybe generally healthy or is trying to become healthier, hasn't established diabetes yet and wants to just monitor things overall. I mean, it, so this is really hard. So if I had a, someone who was healthy but had a family history of, of type 2, because remember, you can be 400 pounds and completely inactive and have totally normal blood glucose levels. Conversely, you can be an athlete and have type 2 diabetes. And, and so genetics or, or hereditary uh, is a hereditary condition. So if someone had a family history of type 2 diabetes, I would definitely keep an eye on all of those things you mentioned. Uh, and I'll come to some of this glucose... Uh, points in a second. Waist circumference and weight. Unfortunately, it's really unsexy. It's just so obvious and boring, but weight is what's driving this. 80% of people with type 2 uh, are overweight. Uh, weight loss prevents type 2 diabetes, helps manage it. Weight gain increases your risk. That's very clear. Um, so if someone's gaining weight gradually over time, that's a danger, especially if they've got a history of type 2. So let me just come to the glucose because mm. we're using hemoglobin A1C. Um, it's cheaper. It doesn't need fasting. It's less variable in the sense that you don't get day-to-day -day fluctuations, but it doesn't capture everyone at risk of, of pre-diabetes. Um, 
<clears throat> so fasting blood glucose and oral glucose tolerance test, that I favor those. If, we could, if I had a private practice and I was screening, I would definitely use oral glucose tolerance tests because they pick up people that A1C doesn't. So remember I said before, you could have a fasting glucose that's normal, could be 5.2. Your postprandial, your two hour glucose could be 10, it could be 11. A1C might not even pick up that patient. Um, and that's a real concern because it's probably the postprandial excursions that are the most risky in terms of cardiovascular disease and other health risks. Right. And it, for that reason, we're starting to see this shift towards more uh, CGM use, this continuous uh, glucose monitoring. Yes. I mean, the problem is CGMs are li they're very expensive and they're licensed for the management of type 2. Mm. There's been no research done in whether they're useful for prevention. If I have patients with prediabetes, I do actually recommend if they can afford them to try and get one because I think it's useful for identifying um, postprandial glucose excursions. But we don't know whether just controlling the excursions per se reduces risk. But I think what it does is it helps people to follow a lower calorie diet. Um, and it's about weight loss. Mm. So if I put a patient on a low carb diet, I actually think stuff like CGM is useful because it helps them monitor whether they're following the diet, that helps compliance and that's gonna help their weight loss. Yeah, there's something about that continuous feedback to someone Continu from a behavioral short -term point of view. Continuous short-term absolutely, yeah. And I think that's what you're probably seeing with a lot of like wearable devices and so on. Yeah. If someone is like really dialed into using them, it's probably more so the, the behavioral aspect as opposed to the data per se a lot Absolutely, of the time. it's the nudge all the time, yeah. Right. Uh, let's get into some questions that people have submitted uh, for you, Nicola, and see what we can uh, get through. Um, so let's start from the start. Uh, one from Aiden. Uh, could adherence to the pre-bariatric surgery diet, so the very low calorie, have been a factor in the variance in results mentioned around remission? Could you repeat the question? So could the adherence to the oh. pre-bariatric surgery diet have been a factor in the variance of results that you see from uh, bariatric surgery, I guess, in that case? Um, possibly could have been a small factor. The problem is, is that we now have so such a large data set long term of different kinds of bariatric surgery and the consistent finding is that it's the duration of type 2 diabetes um, that predicts uh, remission or not. Um, there have been a couple of studies, a colleague of mine at Imperial did one, looking at whether different types of diet prior to bariatric surgery helped with the outcomes, and it didn't really make much of a difference. Okay. Uh, we have an anonymous submission here. Uh, I think it was, how, how many people in the UK have type 2 diabetes, if we know? Um, so in total, it's probably about 3.3 million people. There might be another million people who are diagnosed or undiagnosed, so they have it, but they don't know. Um, but more worryingly, there are probably twice that number who have prediabetes. So typically in a population, however many have type 2, you'll have twice that number have prediabetes. Okay. Uh, have you looked at controlling environmental factors, for example, stress, shift work, sleep, et cetera, and how much of an effect this has on people controlling their diabetes? Oh, that is a great question. There is no data whatsoever on shift work. I'm just excited about this because we're putting a grant in. Uh, shift work might really cause glucose to go crazy. We've done some work with patients of with diabetes in planning our study. And basically what people are told by their doctors or endocrinologists is, oh, you've got diabetes, you're doing shift work, oh, your blood glucose is gonna be rubbish. There's no advice whatsoever because we don't know how to manage it. So what we're trying to do with that study, we're using CGMs um, on a large number of people and we're trying to monitor glucose between day shift, night shift, and rest days. Mm. We're also doing food diaries, sleep diaries, and physical activity monitors to try and look at what people do. Um, because definitely shift work increases your risk of type two independent of, of food intake and weight, um, and it probably worsens cardiovascular outcomes. Stress, I honestly don't know too much about that. The, the physiology and the endocrinology of stress, um, actually, uh, don't ask me because I know nothing about it. Um, and what was the other one? Um, it was... Oh, environmental was, factors. Yeah, I don't so know whether anyone, whether the person sleep. who asked this question meant this, um, but I think it's a really interesting area, is the role of environmental pollutants in the... In the uh, epidemics of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So it's really hard to study, but if you do look at particularly type 1 diabetes, like I, I mentioned, Kuwait for some reason has a really high level of type 1. Finland does as well. No one really knows why. Um, and this growing preclinical, it's all basic because this stuff is hard to do. You can't do it in humans. But really basic research suggesting that environmental pollutants could be also contributing to beta cell dysfunction. 
Amazing. So next question, again, an uh, anonymous submission. Uh, is there a remission possibility for type 1 with similar type 2 interventions that we've discussed? No. So type okay. 1 is completely different. So type, the, the, the damage to the beta cells is via an autoimmune condition in type 1. And essentially in these people, they don't produce insulin. It's not a question of, I guess, a functional beta cell defect. So in type 2, it's moving towards maybe the beta cells don't function properly. Um, whereas in type 1, it just looks like they don't work, period. So absolutely not. All the data so far, there is no evidence you can get um, remission of type 1 diabetes. You can't cure type 1 diabetes. Let me just add something about low carb, because there's lots of people pressing for low carb in type 1. Um, I have patients on it who do super well, and they are able to reduce their prandial insulin dose. So let me just explain this. I mentioned that insulin is excuse me, <clears throat> produced in the fasting state and also after you eat. So when you have type 1, you have to take a basal insulin. That's the insulin that, that replicates your fasting. And then you inject every meal. So there are people on low carb who are able to reduce or come off their, their meal insulin, but they still have to take their basal insulin. And if they don't, they would probably die. So type 1 is a super serious, serious mm -hmm. condition. OK. Um which populations would benefit from large-scale metformin prescription as prevention? Do you see this happening in the future to reduce NHS spend on treatment? Uh, um, so this is a really tough question. So I sat on the NICE guideline committee for prevention of type 2. So that's the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. And we were asked to look at all the evidence around what prevents type 2. Now, if you're looking at data alone, metformin prevents type 2. It does. It's effective. And there were lots of um, more physiological... Phys uh, I'm not physiological, no, I don't mean physiological, philosophical, excuse me, oh my goodness, I haven't had my coffee yet, <laughs> philosophical discussions in the room about, should we be doing this? Yes, it prevents type 2, but should we really be medicalizing something that is lifestyle? Because it's lifestyle. Like, if you go back 200 years, people didn't have type 2. Um, so yes, it's effective, but lots of people think we should not be medicalizing something that is a lifestyle disease. In the US Diabetes Prevention Program, which tested lifestyle against metformin, Lifestyle was more effective than metformin, which is why we have the National Diabetes Prevention Program. But in certain subgroups, uh, metformin was more expensive. So I think pragmatically, metformin is physiologically effective. Uh, and frankly, it's for other people to decide whether we think that should be rolled out. All right. Um, Alzheimer's has been called diabetes type 3. What's your thoughts on this and how to manage it via nutrition? Yeah, so I'll be really honest, I don't know too much about this. The evidence that I've seen, and there are some people at King's doing this, is all quite associational. There is certainly not the smoking gun yet, that it's glucose per se that's causing the damage. Um, I think in general, from what I've seen, we know that sensible lifestyle changes are going to prevent type 2 and manage type 2, and so I would imagine at the moment sticking to those would be good recommendations for um, type 3 or Alzheimer's disease. Um, but again, this is an area, you and I talked about this, where people are making inflated claims mm. when there are, there are no human studies, no good human studies that have established that link. Sure. Um, here's a, a good question, and I probably should have asked myself. Uh, one from Rachel says, would the dietary interventions you've described uh, working to prevent type 2, uh, would it work in a pre-diabetes individual who is not overweight? Um, yes, probably, but again, actually, this is quite difficult to uh, get or to be conclusive about because most of the studies done were in overweight populations. However, there were two diabetes prevention trials, one done in India and one done in China, um, and actually those people were slimmer to start with. So in the Chinese study, uh, the BMI was about 24. Now, because of the difference in visceral fat and liver fat deposition in some ethnicities, including Chinese and Southern Asian, actually they might be, a BMI for a Chinese person of 23 is probably the equivalent of 25.5 in a Caucasian person. But nonetheless, they were slim. But actually, people didn't lose weight, or they certainly didn't lose as much weight, and they still got prevention of type 2. I think it's probably the exercise more than anything else. Um, so that's, that's something I would always recommend anyway. What I, I do think, and whenever I have patients who come to me who are doing everything right, when you get the athletes um, who eat really well, I always find it a challenge with those because if they've got pre-diabetes and they're doing everything right, I think, well, what else am I? What else can I offer here? Mm. And I think that's where probably genetics is playing a stronger role. Okay. Um, 
anonymous question here. Thoughts on monitoring blood glucose whilst being in a calorie surplus trying to build muscle. I've seen a trend of people doing this on social media. Oh, so I, I, we have some other speakers who are better to ask the, the building muscle question. In terms of monitoring blood glucose, I mean, if you are at risk of type 2 um, or you have type 2 and you're eating more, I would still stick to the normal recommendations for glucose to so try to keep your blood glucose level in the ranges that I talked about earlier. Okay. Uh, you mentioned sensors on the pancreas detect glucose in the blood, even tiny amounts. Would substances like polyols or some sweeteners cause this response? Uh, say the first bit again. So the, you mentioned sensors on the pancreas detect yep. glucose in the blood. Uh, would substances like polyols or some sweeteners cause this same response? Oh, as, as that's, that's a great question. No one really knows. Um, and again, part of the reason when I started this talking about why I want to work at Dasman is because all of these, the methodology to, to do these studies is really expensive, so they haven't been done yet. Um, I think there's a plausible reason they could, over time, very, very subtly impair some of the se sensing apparatus, uh, but in humans, we don't have any data to my knowledge yet. Okay, uh, question from Paul. What is the method of detecting liver insulin resistance versus muscle insulin resistance, and would the intervention or treatment be different? Say that, let's start again. Uh, what is the method of detecting liver insulin oh. resistance versus muscle insulin resistance? Okay, so we measure that by something called a clamp. So it's a hyperinsulinemic uh, hyper clamp. Um, and basically that is based on the idea that different tissues are sensitive to insulin at different concentrations. So if you infuse insulin at different concentrations, you look at when you get resistance in the different tissues. Issues. So you have to do a clamp test, nothing else, or everything else is guesswork. The other way is using isotopes um, to measure liver insulin resistance, but it takes about three and a half hours, maybe four. Um, it's really expensive and it, it's a very sophisticated methodology. Okay. In terms of is the diet different, there's some evidence that suggests there is. Again, there haven't been many because clamps are expensive and not many people do them. In general, it looks like uh, polyunsaturated fats, the N6 fats, that's like linoleic acid in sunflower oil, those kind of fats look like they Im improve muscle insulin sensitivity, and they probably do so by integrating themselves in the phospholipid bilayer of the muscle. Um, there's pretty good evidence for that. Um, in terms of liver, it looks like certain fermentable fibers. So those are fibers that or carbohydrates that aren't digested and absorbed in the upper GI. They pass intact to the colon where they're fermented and the products of, of the fermentation might improve specifically maybe in, uh, liver insulin sensitivity. Okay, excellent. A uh, question here from Shannon. In cases where remission has been achieved via a low carbohydrate diet, when would you consider reintroducing carbs and what approach would you take? I wouldn't. So if someone on a low carb diet has maintained their weight or only lost a bit, if they're managing with low carb, I, they have to stick to the diet. That's how it works. If you reintroduce carbs, as far as we know, their glucose goes straight back up again. If someone on a low carb diet had lost 15 kilograms of weight, so essentially it was the direct trial but low carb, I might suggest reintroducing or slightly increasing carb and maybe using a CGM to monitor, but I would guess over time with a bit of weight gain and reintroducing carbs, they would, the type 2 diabetes would return. Okay. Um, let me see. What are some of the main research questions that you would like to see answered around type 2 diabetes or diabetes in general? Um, more work on the beta cells. Like, I, I would imagine 98% of the work done has been on insulin resistance. And actually, no offense to anyone who does this research, everything improves insulin sensitivity. If you walk, if you improve your diet slightly, if you stand up and sit down, if you lose a bit of weight, everything improves insulin sensitivity. Like I alluded to earlier, for reasons we really don't understand, and it's tragic that we don't, it looks like moderate lifestyle approaches don't improve beta cell function. And again, the first point I made in this talk, beta cell failure is the seminal event in the transition from pre-diabetes to type 2. So the fact that we don't know more about it, I think, is shocking. Um, question from George. I think this kind of builds on something we, we may have addressed uh, during the talk. It says, if the area under the curve is the same, would a longer, less spiked insulin response potentially have a more damaging effect? No one knows, but yes, I think probably. So there have been studies uh, on something called pulsatile insulin secretion, where if you infuse insulin into a person's vein, 
um, and you monitor the effect on liver insulin sensitivity, if you infuse the same amount of insulin in a pulsatile fashion, you get in improved insulin sensitivity. The same amount of insulin infused flat, you get insulin resistance. So the pattern of insulin secretion obviously really matters. And I think that's where the pulse and coming down again is probably more uh, beneficial in that regard. Whereas when you're saying kind of the, if the total area into the curve is the same, but it looks like that, I think that would probably, if I had to guess, be more damaging. Okay. Um, is visceral fat loss more important than subcutaneous fat loss for remission of type 2? Probably, but no one really knows. Um, so, for example, lots of people think it's all to do with the liver fat, but the difficulty with that is more studies have measured visceral, visceral fat, and whenever you lose liver, you lose visceral at the same time. Um, but I would guess it, visceral fat is more important than subcutaneous, yes. Okay. Um, is it safe to recommend a 400 calorie per day diet for seven days? Oh, great question. That was done in a hospital. It was done in an inpatient setting. No, I would not. Um, 800 calories for most people because you wouldn't recommend this a very low energy diet in people who aren't overweight generally. The direct guys, by the way, I think are doing this in a slimmer population. But if someone had a BMI of over 27, 800 calories a day, totally fine. But I wouldn't go lower than that. Uh, one question I think relates to you mentioning exercise. Um, weight loss only from nutrition versus weight loss from a combination of nutrition and exercise uh, for improving type 2 if we have the same amount of weight loss in both conditions? So the Chinese Diabetes Prevention Study looked at this because they had a group who were diet alone, a group who were exercise, and a group who were both. There wasn't a difference between diet and exercise, but they didn't lose that much weight. I would guess if weight loss is equivalent... It, the exercise group would do better because they pr would get improved muscle insulin sensitivity. Okay, uh, here's an important one just for, for clarification. I think uh, probably that's my fault. Uh, James asks, is metformin a supplement like vitamin D that everyone should be taking? Oh, I mean, um, no. No, I mean, but, but here's the thing, most of the population are at risk of type 2 now, unfortunately, and if it is effective at preventing type 2 and cardiovascular disease, if it does that physiologically, I mean, maybe, but like, that's, yeah. that's another discussion. Yeah, you're not yeah. going to have to like, I don't think so. I, I think that's giving up. We have, a, we have an environment that is totally unhealthy. Uh, obesity is a totally normal, normal response to our abnormal environment. That's why we have the type 2 epidemic. And I think it's giving up and ignoring the real issue by not addressing our environment. Right, yeah. It's like the whole, uh, let's put statins in the water type thing. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, at what point do we stop? Okay, uh, final few as we round up here. Um, how much importance do you place on nutrient timing when helping people manage diabetes? Or is it about controlling caloric and carbohydrate intake? Is that enough? Oh, that's a great question. We are starting a series of studies looking at meal timing, because clearly it has an effect. Uh, there is lots of studies in people without type 2. There's a couple with where if you have uh, most of the energy in the morning versus at night, you can get better glucose control. Lots of carb in particular at night seem to impair uh, glucose excursions. So we're starting a series of controlled trials looking at that. Um, and we're doing that to try and help shift workers. So for example, if shift workers have a high protein meal before going on the shift, does that help? Like We have no idea at the moment. So that is a great question. That's where research should be going. Yeah, that's interesting. I think might get to touch on that during Martin's session as well. But we, we definitely see with the shift work, for example, just differences in people's carb and fat metabolism oh, for sure, yeah. eating, eating at that time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, super interesting area. Um, question from Aiden. Uh, how overweight do most people need to get before they get type 2? Is it based off somebody's set point or perhaps is it to do with the rate of fat accumulation? And no one knows. Um, so there's mo it's all modeling data. And to be honest, most of it's been done for in Western populations. There was a data done uh, like by Colditz where it estimated that for every... Uh, one kilogram of excess weight gain over your ideal body weight, your risk of type 2 goes up from 4.5 to 9%. Like that's a Caucasian population, uh, and already that's a wide, wide confident, confidence margin. So no one really knows. Um, in terms of rate of weight gain, I, would, I think it would be the same. Mm. Cool. Uh, another question from Shannon, which uh, actually speaks as an area that I'm really interested in. Uh, it's in relation to time-restricted feeding, um, asking, are the results due to the specific time frame, for example, 8 to 2 p.m., 
or more to do with the length of time spent eating and fasting? Um, both could be playing a role. Lots of people, um, researchers in insulin, seem to think it's almost having a rest from insulin. So having a long period where insulin, maybe it's insulin, maybe it's something else, is able to come down really low, and it's that that's beneficial. Um, so certainly the period of time you go without eating plays a role here, but equally, probably, the timing of your eating, because we know chronic nutrition is important, will also impact that. Yeah, actually it's interesting. I was talking with uh, Alan Flanagan, who's a yeah. mutual friend, yeah. and I think his upcoming PhD is embarking on is essentially they're doing a, a trial looking at that, yeah. shifting more of the calories earlier in the day or later in the day, yeah. in the same window, so interesting area. Um, let me see, we'll get to maybe two or three more and we'll be good. Um, that's been addressed. Uh, you mentioned the ketogenic diet. Do you feel there's any major side effects for a woman in late 30s maintaining a ketogenic diet long term because she feels good on her? The problem with, the, with this, we have no long term data and actually a good argument is we don't have long term data on many diets. Um, I wouldn't. I actually wouldn't be concerned. Um, I think if you're healthy, you like the diet. Uh, it helps you manage your weight or risk factors. I think it's great. I would just recommend that anyone on that diet make sure they get enough fibre, so from non-starch veggies, like low glycemic fruits, nuts, seeds, that kind of thing. But I think any dietary pattern, as long as it has it's lots of variety, low carb, high carb, um, I think is fine. Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, does snacking have negative implications for insulin sensitivity? Would three to six isolated meals throughout the day reduce risk of type 2 diabetes? So, uh, if anything, I think it p p might increase it, but if it does, possibly only slightly. There's a couple of studies where they give three larger meals versus three smaller meals, and it looks like if you have a risk of type 2, uh, possibly that could cause some uh, metabolic uh, problems that it might increase insulin, fasting insulin slightly. Um, I do think in general we have this idea that we need to snack. Like if you like snacking because that that's, works with your schedule, great. But the idea that we need to snack to keep our energy levels up is complete rubbish. Mm. Uh, lots of the marketing has been led by food agent or food industry saying I'll have this snack and we just uh, snack on 500 extra calories a day sometimes and that's one of the major contributors to weight gain. Okay. Um. Could you repeat why a steep peak and trough of blood sugar is beneficial compared to less pronounced, I suppose, peaks and, and valleys? Oh, I mean, so my point about that, about the peaks and troughs with glucose and how high it should be, is that people are making statements and claims when we don't have any evidence that it's a problem. So like I said, we have these clear criteria for pre-diabetes and type 2, where, which are clearly linked uh, to poor health outcomes. Um, and so my point around the peaks and troughs and what's good or bad is that people are claiming things are good or bad when actually there's no evidence that they are. I actually don't know whether it makes a difference 30 minutes after you eat, whether your blood glucose gets to 5.6 or 7.8 or 10. I don't know and I don't think anyone knows uh, because there's no data whether that's a problem or not. So we shouldn't be making claims about it. Okay, uh, here's one that relates to actually a recent uh, podcast episode. So um, I, I believe this is in relation to the one with uh, Alpana Shukla, who's, who's looked at food order and how that affects the glycemic response. Um, so it's asking, uh, the, the guest suggested the order in which we eat our meal, i.e. carbohydrates, last after uh, protein and, and fiber, plays a role in the blood glucose response does this have any implication for type 2 diabetes? Yes, it does. And I think that that's really nice data that's there. And it's really practical to give advice to patients with type 2. So I use low carb a lot in my practice. But for patients who are really struggling with blood glucose rises after they eat and who don't want to cut carbs, by altering the order of what they eat on their plate actually can have a real impact. So I think that's, that's very sensible. Okay, I think we'll probably have time for, for one more. Um, someone asks about inulin supplement to improve visceral fat and therefore type 2 diabetes? Ooh, great question. I did my PhD on inulin. Um, so inulin is a fermentable carbohydrate. So when I was talking about those carbs that are fermented by the resident bacteria in the colon, uh, inulin is one of them. Um, in our study, so we did it in pre-diabetes people and we measured uh, their visceral fat and liver fat using MRI. We didn't find an effect on visceral fat, but we did in liver fat. 
um, those were really small numbers in the study, and we only saw the effect in people who had a high liver fat at baseline. The rodent data is much more convincing. That does look like consistently inulin and carbohydrates like it reduce, independent of weight loss, atopic fat. But the thing about rodent studies is you can give tons of fiber. So the amount of fiber they give to rodents is equivalent of giving 60, 70 grams a day to humans, which causes gastrointestinal upset. So um, I think over time it's probably beneficial, but I don't think it's going to do anything dramatic. Right, okay. So part of a bigger picture, I think, yeah. there. Um, might be able to get into the final one here. Uh, do you think there is a potential benefit of low carbohydrate during the honeymoon period in type 1 diabetes? in an attempt to preserve beta cell function? Um, honestly, I don't know, but everything that I've seen in terms of intensive insulin treatment um, upon diagnosis, I would be very surprised if it did. Um, but what I would say, so I work with a guy called Nick Oliver, who's a, a professor of type 1 diabetes at Imperial College, and whenever I talk to him, I realize how little I know about type 1, and then I know how little most people know about type 1. Um, that I think it's far more complicated than we think in terms of the immunological factors that are involved in beta cell decline. Okay, so just to wrap up, Nicola, if you were to leave something uh, for people to, to take away as your main message or one main point that you're most passionate about promoting in this area, what would you say that would be? Um, that everything pales into significance compared to weight gain. Excellent. So with that, we'll wrap up our first session. So everyone, a round of applause for Dr. Nicola Guest. Um.